And 40 years ago tomorrow, two CTA elevated trains collided in Chicago's loop during rush hour, sending car after car onto the street at Lake and Wabash. It was the worst CTA crash ever. Nothing like it has happened since. As WGN traffic reporter Sarah Jinder reports, Chicagoans who saw and worked the crash site carry those images to this day. I came in on Lower Wacker, so I couldn't see or hear anything. And once I got out to the office, everyone said, you got to see this. Look out the window. Forty years ago, Michael Kessler was a 16-year-old Loyola Academy student reporting for work on a Friday night at his dad's print shop at 35 East Wacker. We were able to see everything up on the tracks since Harold Washington College wasn't here then. We had a straight shot from our second floor to that second level. So we were able to see the two or three cars that fell to the street. His dad and uncle told everyone to keep working, afraid of getting in the way of first responders and of what they might see if they got too close. I feel bad that we're talking about 11 families who lost people 40 years ago. 11 dead. 266 injured and property damage of $1.2 million. It was a uh, Lake Street train that didn't slow properly, didn't break and bumped the back of the Ravenswood train and it was right, ha it just happened to be right at the turn and the inertia carried him over. Seven two is on the scene now, four two four. Three two at the scene. Rick Nosek was an EMT with an all volunteer unit that worked closely with the Chicago Fire Department on major fires and disasters. I was 20 years old. It was three days before my 21st birthday. He heard the emergency call in his car on the way to work and used his official parking placard to cross police and fire lines. I remember putting it in my dashboard, getting out of the car, and a Chicago police officer said, you can't park here. And I said, no, I can. He said, well, look up. And I looked up, and there was a CTA car hanging over my car. It was a surreal scene. I saw an arm underneath the car, and it was like, wow, I wonder if that person was under the train or was inside the train or whatever. And that's when I knew that it was, wow, this is pretty serious. They didn't have triage like we have today, where they would sort the wounded out by severity of injury. It was more grab and go. Uh, 472, what is your specific location? That breathless voice belongs to Gary Altwasser, a volunteer squad man with the Chicago Fire and Rescue who was less than five minutes from the crash site. 471 is the specialized truck he was driving to the scene. And I was the closest one to the radio, so I ran over to the rig and jumped in and reported that uh, we were on the scene and gave our location so that they knew that the triage unit was there just to see L cars, one sitting in the middle of the intersection, another one hanging over, and the other one hanging over. You just can't conceive that right away. About a decade ago, Altwasser started a website, chicagofd.org, and runs a museum in an old firehouse on Southwestern Avenue. It's an amazing collection of a time gone by when simple machines sounded fire alarms and trained civilians stepped up to help Chicago firefighters. Much has changed in 40 years. The Volunteer Emergency Preparedness Unit was placed out of service in 1989. Train lines are now colors, not destinations. And giant girders on curves in the loop keep trains on the tracks, not the street. And I remember riding it about a year after the wreck, and your heart kind of stops a little bit as you're making that curve the first time saying, could it happen again? And of course, they put up barriers. It couldn't happen again that way. But it was still kind of eye-opening just how fragile life can be. In the loop, Sarah Jindra, WGN News. Good story, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. The National Transportation Safety Board ruled the cause of the crash to be human error, yet despite the carnage, the wreckage was cleared and the trains running on time. This is very Chicago. Yeah. By 6.30 the next morning. CTA released a statement that reads in part, safety is the Chicago Transit Authority's number one priority as evidenced by the fact that we have one of the strongest safety records of any major transit agency in the nation. You can share this story and find links for more information at WGNTV.com.
Today marks the 40th anniversary of the worst elevated train accident in CTA history. 11 people killed when an eight car train rear ended another train at the curve just above Lake Street and Wabash around 5.30 p.m. on a Friday night. Two train cars plunged to the street. Two were left hanging off the track. Most passengers crawled out of the twisted metal, but others, they had to be freed by firefighters. WGN-TV stagehand Rick Nosick was on the job or on his way to his job at the Schubert Theater when he heard about that accident. And at the time, he was a volunteer with the Chicago Fire Department's rescue unit. And he's joining us this morning to talk about his memories of that day. Thanks, Rick, for coming in. Happy to be here. So it, this was obviously something I don't remember, but I always look at that curve and I mm -hmm. wonder um, what could possibly happen. The worst thing that could possibly happen did it happen. It did. So did you hear it or? You, how did you come to I was be at on the my scene? way to work and I had a scanner in the car because part of the unit we would respond all over the city for extra alarms and disasters and so I was hearing this transmission going on about a train and then when I heard it was really bad I went right to the scene because I had my gear in the car and when I got there we had placards in our car to allow us to cross fire lines in the park I jumped out of the car and a police officer came up and said, you can't park here. And I said, yeah, I really can. I have to help. And he said, no, look overhead. And there was a train actually hanging over the car. Mm -hmm. So I moved my car out and uh, started helping. Our triage unit was out there and that had stretchers and medical bags. Right. But triage really didn't exist back then. Right. It was more take everyone and just throw them in a car. And they were taking people and putting them in chief's cars three or four people in a car and just going to hospitals. And in fact, at one point, the hospitals were saying, the hospital said, we can't take anymore. And so the dispatch said, we'll just find a hospital somewhere. Rick, this, you were a young guy back then. I was 20. Did you understand just how serious this was when you came when, on the scene at that was young of an age? Up, when I was driving up, I knew that it was bad. I didn't know how bad. I was an emergency medical technician. I was just starting paramedic school. So I had kind of an idea that they don't go crazy. They're very calm usually. And there was so much excitement when I got there and you could see the train sitting on the street. And I walked up and there was a woman's arm on the ground with a car on top of it. So wow. I knew then it was pretty bad. What was the scene like? Describe it again for us. You say Organized it was chaos. chaos. Yeah. It was organized chaos. I mean, because they didn't have the, the equipment right away. And when the first chiefs pull up, it's something that's kind of overwhelming. You don't expect some, something of that scale. So they were trying to just grab and go, and they were taking people as they were pulling them off. There was no sorting. Like today, you would sort your criticals, your less injured, and so on. It didn't matter. They'd just take them and go to an emergency room. That may, There were no trauma centers, so they didn't really have anything organized for that. This happened on a Friday night during the rush hour. During the rush hour. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of people on these trains. Both, both the... Uh, Ravenswood train and the Lake Street train were pretty full. And what was your sense when you were helping triage these people in trying to get them the help that they needed? We were. I was actually like kind of in autopilot mode. I right. knew that I had to take people out. I knew I had to help them out. I had to look for injuries and try and treat whatever I could. But again, we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have ambulances. And you also have to remember back then, they were still using a lot of Cadillac ambulances because they didn't have the type you see today, which are fully equipped mobile With intensive other care units. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have many paramedics in the city. So you brought in your helmet here. Yeah. This is your helmet. This was the badge from that day? This is the badge from that day, the 472. That was the triage unit of the fire department. My helmet is from my later career in the, in the suburban fire department. Amazing. Amazing. In what, how many years now? 40 years, we say? 40 how years. How much medical uh, technology has advanced? The, the, and the training treatment. has changed. We have triage. We now know when we have, we plan for disasters, which they really didn't do like then. Uh, we plan for it. We have communications. We have command structure that will sit there and say, we'll take the criticals to this hospital and to there. Right. And it's uh, it's pretty good. It's, it's uh, an impressive improvement All right. if you're going to get hurt. Many lessons learned out of that, not only for your uh, end, but also for the CTA. Certainly lots of new place, uh, they learned, policies well, they put, the, put into they place. They put the, yeah. uh, the big bars. girder right. up to yeah. prevent it from ever right. happening again. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So we have that. I would like to put out a mention for people interested in the history of it, the firemuseumofgreaterchicago.org. They have sites of it. They actually have an audio recording of this uh, traffic. And so it's it's a very interesting resource. We and have an interesting museum. As well. All right, All right Rick. Rick thank you so much, in. Rick. Appreciate okay. it. We'll be right